Uh, Martha, to what degree, you know, I was looking over some of the numbers today from some of the various hotly contested races, and you have, for example, uh, West Virginia with a plus 42 that President Trump won by. Um, and, and I look at some place like Virginia. Now, West Virginia, of course, the coal and the opioid issue won that largely for him. And um, but, you know, it, you would think then that a Republican could just walk in and beat Manchin. We don't know if that's going to happen. Apparently, the president thinks it's winnable. He is going there. However, um, you know, I think it's interesting. You and I were together this week at the walk away uh, yes. and Blexit events as those were all going down in Washington, D.C. And we noted that the president was speaking, and I believe he's the first president, at least in a long time, uh, you can clarify this as a farmer, to speak to the F FAA um, meeting. And, and I, or FFA, sorry, uh, yes, FFA, there you go. Yeah, that one. Meeting. <laughs> and, uh, and, and you thought this was particularly noteworthy. And my curiosity is what role will that play if you have any idea, you know, him being perhaps the most farmer-friendly president in a long time, uh, like he's, like some have called him the most black president in a long time. I think Pastor Daryl Scott and others, most Jewish president in a long yes. time. Uh, we're hearing a lot about that this week. If he's the most farm-friendly president in a long time, what role will that play in this Virginia race, first of all, and in the midterms in whole? It it's huge. You know, um, President Donald J. Trump is the first president in over 30 years to speak at the Future Farmers Association Summit. And the reason why this is so important all across our country is, of course, because our farmers are the heartbeat and backbone of America. And in Virginia in particular, uh, farming, agriculture, is Virginia's number one industry. It produces over half a million jobs. It produces uh, opportunity and new uh, growing opportunity. We have a thriving winery, a brewery, and distillery uh, industry, as well as cideries blossoming throughout the Commonwealth. We also are some of the largest producers of agricultural goods all across our great nation. So the fact that our president is fighting for our, for our farmers all across our nation is huge, but especially in Virginia, where it's our number one industry. You know, Martha, I love your story, and I think it's significant. I don't often ask guests to tell their stories, but you, your whole life, wanted to be a farmer. Your parents told you you needed to be a lawyer. Sounds like good parental advice, something I might say to my <laughs> children. You said, okay, I'll do that, but then I want to be a farmer. And today you are a farmer. And um, and I find it really fascinating that, um, that, you know, the farmers have taken center stage again under this president in ways. But did you expect that? I did, you know, when, and you know, because you worked so hard on, on the trail for President Trump, and as you know, he touched the hearts and minds of of the West in, in our country, the heartbeat of America, the bread belt of America. For far too long, our farmers have been neglected and not given an even hand in trade all across our country, and our president promised to make American farmers first, and that's exactly what he has done. He's done that by evening the playing fields when it comes to tariffs. He's provided more opportunity also by deregulating the burdensome red tape that is so heavily, weighs so heavily upon the American family farmer. And, uh, and the fact that our president has done so much for rural America, by making rural America first, by making our American farmers first, by deregulating burdensome regulations, it's going to make a huge difference in these midterms and particularly in the Commonwealth of Virginia. President Trump has quite the campaign rally schedule coming up. Uh, you can see it right here. I will be uh, with him at the Fort Myers, Florida one tomorrow, and I will also be at the rally with him in Missouri, where we will, uh, where he will rally for Josh Harley. Then he goes on to West Virginia, Indiana, Georgia, ending with a rally in an undisclosed location and date in Ohio somewhere. How does he do this? I don't know, You travel John. with him. How does a man 72 <laughs> years old keep up with this schedule? I don't know, Martha. You know, some, though, in the liberal media, they've literally turned the narrative to be like this. They're saying he's doing too many rallies. It's going to backfire. Your thoughts? I, I disagree. These, the American people crave these opportunities to have one-on-one -on -one with the president of the United States and the vice president. We just had the vice president in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And having the opportunity to have these rallies, to have these large town halls, the American people love it. They want to interact with our president. Many of them stand in line for hours and hours and hours for the for opportunity yeah. to experience <laughs> what I believe is you know, the greatest president in the history of our country. Martha, let's uh, switch gears and talk about this reporter, Julia Yaffe. Now, she was fired from Politico 
over tweeting something incredibly disgusting about President Trump and his daughter. I'm not even going to repeat it. Thank you. It was absolutely reprehensible. Politico that leans left fired her. Well, now she's back out there claiming on CNN of all places, predictably, that President Trump has radicalized more people than ISIS. Listen to this. This president, one of the things that he really launched his presidential run on is talking about Islamic radical radicalization. And this president has radicalized so many more people than ISIS ever did. I mean, the way he talks, the way he, the it, way he. That is, that's just, it, it's, it's The way he talks, the way, the way that he uh, allows these people, the way he winks and nods to these groups. Now, here's my problem. Martha, if a conservative had ever said that, had ever said that, not only would they have been asked to leave the panel before the end of the, of the subsequent break, they would be blacklisted. They would never be invited on CNN or probably any other network again. But if a conservative had tweeted what she had previously tweeted yeah. about the president and his daughter, reprehensible, will not repeat it on air, don't want to repeat never it work again. off air, they would never work again they would ne they would be an absolute pariah would they not you're absolutely correct and this is just another example of the unhinged radicalized left you know they're also publishing articles about assassinating our president right. and you know we have a situation here in our country where as as Gina and I saw firsthand the walk away movement Democrats are walking away from the outrage, the outrageous behavior, the disgusting, depicable behavior of the radicalized left that we just heard right now. Uh, and they're walking away and they're walking toward the Republican Party. They're walking toward a party of opportunity, a party that doesn't engage in theatrics or fake news or uh, this type of outrageous, egregious behavior. And and with, together with Blexit, uh, we're going to see uh, Democrats coming to the Republican Party, and we embrace them with open arms. We welcome them because this is completely outrageous. This is an unhinged Democrat Party calling for violence, calling for attacks against our, our president and this administration and the Republican Party, the GOP, and it's outrageous. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Martha Benetta, thanks so much for joining us. Martha, always great to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Such a pleasure. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to see more breaking news coverage, exclusive interviews, and great videos, click over here to our YouTube channel and subscribe. And don't forget to download the free Newsmax TV app. Newsmax TV, it's real news for real people.